Welcome back to the Agora Cafe, where I drop first-rate truth bombs while drinking third-rate American coffee. Skull. Uh, this video is probably going to be pretty short because I don't really have time to make a longer one. I've got too many deadlines screaming past me like F-15s. But I wanted to have something to commemorate the one-year anniversary of my YouTube channel. And that's today, July 15th. At least today, when you're, you know, when you're seeing this, or at least the earliest that you could see this, uh, the day I'm going to post it. When I'm recording, this is actually the ninth, but I have to allow time for editing and uh, uploading to YouTube, and then YouTube processing it. You know, there's always a Gununga gap between uh, when it's recorded and when it goes live. I've got Iceland behind me, which is thematically appropriate for. Uh, today's lecture. I'm also rocking my Hanover High School t-shirt, which doesn't have any thematic con connection to this movie, but, you know, got to represent. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I said, this is going to be a short topic. It's not going to be an interview. I actually had planned to have an interview uh, that would be the uh, video that I would post for the one-year anniversary, but the person I was going to interview had to delay, and I have to say had a pretty good excuse, I th I'd say, for delaying. Um, uh, this is also not going to be my, you know, my fatwa on how libertarianism and uh, critical race theory are the natural completions of one another. I, I want to do something like that, but I you know, don't have time right now. Um, but if you want to see something longer by me, I've got a, that recent um, uh, talk I gave on left libertarianism uh, to the Prague chapter of the Students for Liberty uh, that you can check out. It's not, you know, it's not an uh, it's not an Agora Cafe video, so you won't find it on that page. But I'll have a link to that in the description. So if you want, if you wanted something longer from me, uh, you can uh, you can uh, check that out. Anyway, so uh, my topic for today is eight things you may not have known about the island at the top of the world. Now, unlike the last things you may not have known video I did, which was on the Three Musketeers, this is about a much less well-known topic. Indeed, my first thing that you may not have known about this movie is this movie exists. Uh, so it's a 1974 Disney movie. It's kind of a mashup of Jules Verne and H. Ryder Haggard. It involves an expedition to the Arctic in a rather steampunk, air, steampunk airship called the Hyperion to locate the hidden valley of Astrogard, which is kind of a mashup of Asgard with either the Greek word for star, which was later borrowed into Latin, as in the uh, saying, uh, Ad Astra Peraspera, which is inscribed on uh, my mysterious ring, uh, or the Sanskrit word for supernatural weapon. But anyway, uh, in this hidden valley of Astrogard, we find Vikings still living the old Viking uh, lifestyle. And uh, when, uh, when they arrive, there's a bit of a conflict between the visitors and the visitees. Uh, but it's the, uh, the uh, I think what I loved most of all was, was stuff before they even get to the Viking. Uh, when I first saw this uh, as a kid, what I liked most of all, before they even get to the, the hidden uh, valley that's kept forever warm by you know, thermal springs, there's A, the coolness of the uh, airship, B, the coolness of just the Arctic landscape as they're traveling, uh, and see uh, the music about which more anon. Uh, number two, the second thing you may not have known about the island at the top of the world is the script is by Joss Whedon's grandfather. You know, so the script is by John Whedon, uh, who was a scriptwriter for many different things, but he's probably best known for his work on the Donna Reed show, which is something. Product a bit different from this, um, 
but he is indeed the grandfather of the once celebrated and nowadays not quite so celebrated uh, uh, Joss Whedon, um, uh, who is you know, best known for things like uh, the uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Firefly and the Avengers and now unfortunately best known for some other things as well. Uh, third thing you may not have known, the script is based on a novel by the author of Walkabout. So the script is based on a novel titled The Lost Ones by Ian Cameron, but Ian Cameron is one of several pseudonyms of the English author Donald Gordon Payne. And under a different pseudonym, James Vance Marshall, Payne wrote the novel Walkabout, which was the basis for the 1971 movie starring Jenny Agutter, on whom, like many boys my age, I had a serious crush back in my callow youth. Uh, fourth thing you may not have known, the director of this movie also directed Mary Poppins and King Solomon's Mines. So the director is Robert Stevenson, no relation to Robert Louis Stevenson, as far as I know, who directed a number of properties for Disney, but the one that's best known of those is Mary Poppins. But he also directed the original 1937 British version of King Solomon's Mines, uh, a, a movie with which this movie has certain things in common, uh, you know, visiting a, uh, a lost civilization You know, those, those lost civilization stories that Haggard wrote that were the inspiration for all the lost civilization stories that people like Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote and so on. Uh, fifth thing you may not have known, the lead actor of the movie is better known as a journalist. So the lead actor here, or at least one of the lead actors, you could debate who the lead actor is. But anyway, one of the main characters is played by David Hartman, who is best known as the host of Good Morning America, which I guess counts as journalism, uh, from 1975 to 1987. Now that's, you know, his name may not be familiar to younger viewers, but, uh, you know, to the old fogies like me, you remember David Hartman primarily as a journalist, but he spent the decade previous to that uh, in acting. And I, I haven't seen many things he was an actor in. I've seen a couple of other ones, but this is the one that sticks in my mind. Sixth thing you may not have known about the island at the top of the world. The music is by the incomparable Maurice Jarre. Now, I was always a fan of the music for this movie. Uh, yeah, ever since I was a kid, I had a... Um, I had an album, it wasn't a soundtrack album, it wasn't just the music, but I had an album that, uh, you know, a story album, but included some of the music in it. Uh, I was also a fan from an early age of the music of Maurice Shaw, who did, you know, he did uh, yeah, music for soundtracks of, of many movies, but perhaps best known for ones like The Doctor Zhivago, Lawrence of Arabia, and later on Shogun. Uh, and I, I was always fond of those. In fact, the, uh, you know, from pretty early age, the soundtrack album for Dr. Zhivago was, and today still is, one of my favorite pieces of music. Just the, you know, the soundtrack album for Dr. Zhivago is just, you know, I can just listen to the whole thing as a kind of symphony. Uh, it is so amazingly good. Um, I don't think any of his other work, you know, quite to the same level as, as Javago, but it's all good. But at the time that I saw first saw the movie Island at the Top of the World, although by that time I'm pretty sure that I had heard the soundtrack for Dr. Zhivago by that point. Um, not absolutely certain I had, but I'm pretty certain I had. Uh, and maybe Lawrence as well, though I'm less sure of that. It would have been pre-Shogun, but uh, at the time I saw that, uh, saw it, I didn't realize, I mean, I didn't see the name on the screen. Uh, at least I don't recall having seen it on the screen. I didn't realize that, the, that this was also by Marie Char. Now, when I listen to the music now, it's obvious to me that it's Marie Char. It's, you know, it's just, it, uh, you know, it's like listening to, 
uh, John Williams or someone. I mean, they're just they're just these obvious signature features of it. In particular, I can now see in in hindsight that a lot of what he was doing in this 1974 score was prefiguring what he was later on going to be doing in uh, the soundtrack for the 1980 miniseries Shogun, uh, starring Richard Chamberlain, based on James Clavell's novel. Uh, which I will not play a clip from here because I don't want to uh, bring the Disney IP hawks down upon me. But there's a um, there's a nice clip of the opening theme of the uh, movie uh, of um, of this movie in uh, I, uh, on YouTube that I will put in the description uh, so you can. Uh, check out that link. But anyway, so that, as I mentioned, that was one of the three things that uh, that uh, you know endeared this movie to me. Uh, you know the you know, the the cool airship and uh, and uh, the. Uh, you know, the Arctic uh, landscapes and uh, and the soundtrack. A seventh thing, seventh thing that you may not have known about Island at the Top of the World. So several of the characters' names, or in some cases their titles, are nods to the Icelandic Eddas and sagas. Now this was certainly not uh, not particularly on my radar. Uh, as a kid, although I had read, you know, I had read some Norse mythology. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, I was a fan of Norse mythology and Greek mythology, those two in particular. Um, but there's some things I didn't get to you know, pick up on. So two of the characters are named Sigurd or you know, Sigurdr, I guess would be in the uh, in old old Norse. Sigurd and Gunnar, who of course are also those are also the names of the friends who are turned enemies or antagonists in the saga of the Volsungs, which is the Icelandic counterpart of the Nibelungenlied, the Lay of the Nibelungs, uh, where they're called Siegfried and Gunther. And Sigurd and, and Gunnar also show up uh, in the Eddas as part of that same uh, story. That's the whole the whole legend about the about the horde of the Nibelungs and uh, Fafner and Brunhilde and, and all that good stuff, which Wagner later on uh, rather freely adapted uh, for his own purposes. But also, uh, the uh, in the movie there are uh, you know, characters who known just by their titles: the Gothi and the Law Speaker. And those are titles that are going to be uh, that are familiar as parts of the Icelandic legal system. From you know, if you read if you read the Icelandic family sagas, or as they're called in Iceland, the sagas of Icelanders, which is not the same thing as Icelandic sagas. It's a subset of Icelandic sagas. Also, be familiar to readers of David Friedman or Jesse Bayek. Now, you shouldn't assume that the role of the roles of the Gothi or the law speaker in this movie. Are fanatically faithful to their historical role in Iceland. You know, you might be sadly disappointed there, but still, it's clearly a reference. Uh, you know, someone had obviously uh, glanced at, at least glanced at history uh, there, and then uh, probably, uh, you, know, well, you know, just as the Monty Python skit about Neural Saga it borrows its title from the Atlantic Nail saga. And also there's a reference, you know, there are a couple of other references in there like reference to Kettle Trout. Uh, that's a character who often shows up in, uh, in uh, the Atlantic saga's genealogies. In addition, in this movie, there's also a character named Freya who was uh, an Asgardian goddess. And she also obviously is someone who shows up in the Eddas and finally, see, I told you this was going to be a uh, a short video. Uh, finally, the eighth thing you might not have known about 
the island at the top of the world it was, there was supposed to be a Disneyland ride based on this movie. They had planned, when they were making the movie, they also planned to tie it in with a ride, uh, as a number of Disney movies have been tied in with rides, or sometimes, sometimes the ride is inspired by the movie, sometimes the movie is inspired by the ride. Uh, anyway, they'd made plans for it, but the movie was a flop. I mean, uh, it was a it was a hit with ten year old me, but it was a flop with the general public. You know, not a complete flop. I, mean, I believe it made more money than it cost, so that's that's something. But still, it wasn't successful enough that they wanted to uh, base a uh, uh, base a ride on it, and so that was. Uh, a plan foregone. However, at Disneyland Paris, I understand that in the video op video not video opolis, videopolis complex, there's a replica of the airship Hyperion from this movie, and there's also a restaurant named after that airship. Uh, I've never been to Disneyland Paris. Um, you know, during my all too brief visits to Paris, it really didn't seem like a a priority. I love Disneyland and I love Paris, but uh, never been quite sure that uh, you know, that mixing them together would be my, uh, you know, it's like I like, um, uh, you know, I like chocolate cake and I like uh, mustard sauce, but I have no desire to mix the two. Uh, now, if I were to stay a long time in Paris, uh, I would, uh, I would um, I would probably get over to Disneyland Paris eventually, but you know, it's never been a top priority. Uh, for the same reason that I've never, I've never been into McDonald's in Europe, despite there being all over the place. I have a mild curiosity about it, but the, and if I were to stay for a long time in Europe, I'd certainly try it out to see you know, the little differences, as Tarantino calls them, but the opportunity cost given my short visits always seem too great. Um, but anyway, there is some kind of uh, uh, memorial to this movie uh, at Disneyland Paris at Videopolis, um, which is apparently a complex that's devoted to um, the, uh, the history of various science fictional things, uh, you know, honoring, for example, uh, Jules Verne. So anyway, uh, as, I, uh, uh, as I said, um, that's all I got. So peace out.